Welcome back. We've talked about Botox, dermal fillers, laser tattoo removal, some of the more common things you do in your office. You've got some new things, too, that you're offering for people um, in terms of dermatological care. 2940, what is that and who would need it? That's a 2940. 2940. Yep. Okay, what is 2940? It's a fractional laser. We talked a little bit in the first segment uh -huh. about laser resurfacing and about what we call fractional technology. There's two kinds. Okay. There's non-ablative where you have no downtime. It takes about five treatments and you right. get about 25, 30% improvement in wrinkles. Uh -huh. Also uh, dark spots, whatnot. The 2940 gives you a 50 to 75% improvement, which is similar to the traditional carbon dioxide laser. But that laser resurfacing would take three weeks uh -huh. to get to to heal, and this takes five or six days. Okay, with a 2940, say somebody like me in their early 30s comes in to see you, and I have certain areas on my face that may be starting mm -hmm. to develop wrinkles. Am I too young? Do, are my wrinkles too small right now? Or if I get treated now, is it going to prevent the deeper wrinkles in the future? Well, with your skin being very healthy, not a lot of fine lines or wrinkles at all. I may suggest something simpler like Botox to okay. maintain the results. But in someone who says in their 50s, 60s, or 70s that has the deeper lines, uh, a lot of sun damage, the 2940 would be appropriate for them. They would get a more dramatic result. Uh, they would get results in two weeks, mm -hmm. and they would only have five or six days of healing time. And it's actually a very safe procedure compared to the traditional carbon dioxide laser, which did have a number of side effects. So great for somebody with the deeper wrinkles, maybe mm -hmm. a little bit older. Mm -hmm. Okay. We've got some really good pictures that Joe could pop these up of a camera system that you all offer at your practice that you can see the sun damage mm -hmm. and all the damage that you've done over the years to your skin. Kind of right. walk me through these pictures. This is basically someone, uh, it's our new Profect medical camera system. We started using a digital cameras when we opened the practice and we take thousands of photographs every year. But this is a step up. This is what we call standardized photography. So it uses controlled lighting, controlled positioning of the patient, and we can take uh, photographs in both what we call standard daylight and also ultraviolet photographs, which show you what's beneath the skin. So you may, may see someone like this who looks like they're, you know, they have very little sun damage, mm -hmm. their skin's very healthy, and then you look underneath the ultraviolet and you can actually see the pigmentation, the sun damage that's underlying. So it's a good way for us to follow up a person's progress through their treatment course, mm -hmm. give them an accurate report of how they're doing, and we can also assess the skin to determine what treatments are best for the patient. So somebody like this, like you pointed out, she looks great. Her skin is very clear, fair. Mm -hmm. She doesn't have any of the splotchiness, really, mm -hmm. that that a lot of people do have, but then you put her under the light and you realize mm -hmm. that she really does have a ton of sun damage. Is mm -hmm. this from years of exposure? Years of exposure over time in a fair skinned person. And this person's actually had some treatments done and this was much, much worse before. Uh, it's improved dramatically uh, since we started. But you still see some of the underlying sun damage that probably wouldn't be removed until she had a, um, a more aggressive laser surfacing such as with the 2940, which hasn't been done yet. Now seeing somebody like that with all of that sun damage that you see underneath the light. Is that any indication that this person might have um, skin cancer down the road? Obviously, when you increase the amount of sun damage a person has, there is an increase of skin cancer. Can We haven't done the research to actually connect these type of photographs mm -hmm. to the skin cancer, but it just follows in that a person with more sun damage has a higher risk. Okay, you're offering skin cancer screenings in conjunction with Rover St. Francis. Mm -hmm. Tell me about those. Who can come? How successful have they been? They've been wildly successful. Anyone can come. They're usually advertised in the paper. Rubber St. Francis does a great job marketing them. We generally screen an average of 200 to 240 patients per time. We do it twice a year. Mm -hmm. Usually they're done in May, which is melanoma month, right. and usually one October, November, you know, December in that time period. So twice a year. Uh, conducted at either Roper or St. Francis, mm -hmm. and last year we found seven melanomas among our participants. Wow, out of the 200-something, mm -hmm. that is a significant number, mm -hmm. though, seven, because melanoma, tell, tell people a little bit about melanoma, what it is and, and how dangerous it can be. Melanoma is the most dangerous of the three most common types of skin cancer. We have basal cell and squamous cell and melanoma. Mm -hmm. Melanoma will occur, will occur four to 500,000 times, uh, will occur 100 to 120,000 times a year in the United States. Are there certain areas of the body that it's most likely to appear? It's most likely to appear in men on the trunk mm -hmm. and on the arms and in women on the legs. Okay. And it's a deadly form of skin cancer that can transmit into the body through the lymphatic system and spread anywhere in the body. Okay, so what do you do if you find um, that somebody has a melanoma? They have a melanoma. It all, it all depends on how deep the melanoma, melanoma is after we remove it. Once you remove it and determine how deep it is, there is a whole set of criteria we call staging that determine how the 
patient is treated, whether they're treated with simple removal of the melanoma, which can be curative right. in patients with very thin melanomas, on up to the deeper melanomas, which may require radiation therapy, chemotherapy, or whatnot to maintain that in a lifetime of follow-up. If you're diagnosed with having skin cancer, is it, are your chances higher that you have some of these other types too, the basal cell or some of these other different types of skin cancer if you have a melanoma or not necessarily? They're not connected really in any way. They're connected actually they very connected. well. If you have a basal cell, which is the most common type, mm -hmm. basal cell carcinoma, you have a 50% chance of having another basal cell in the next five years. If you have melanoma, then you're definitely at higher risk for another one. We don't know exactly the percentages yet, mm -hmm. but we find that anyone with a first-degree relative or even a second-degree relative with melanoma should be screened with a full-body exam to make sure they don't have one. I want to know this. When is it too late? Have you done all the damage that you're going to do or most of the damage if, say, you were 18 and 19 and 20 and you used to bake in the sun, but now in your 30s you run from it? I mean, have, have you ruined your skin by that point? Well... It's all cumulative. I always tell people to look at the skin like a copy machine. If you take a piece of paper and copy it again and again and again from the, mm -hmm. from the copy, it's going to look worse and worse and worse over time. But if you stop that and take an original and start copying from the original, it'll look mm -hmm. better. Basically, it all adds up. So if you've had some, a lot of sun damage when you were younger, you can certainly reverse that by staying out of the sun. Your body will heal itself. But that damage has been done. Mm -hmm. So what you don't want to do is add to it. But certainly it's better to take precautions. Since that damage has been done and in that picture that we saw of the lady with the fair skin that mm -hmm. didn't look like she had a lot of sun damage, but you put her under the light and she really did. Mm -hmm. Who should have a dermatologist? I mean, you could think you were fine with, with the face there mm -hmm. on, on your left side of the screen, but, but maybe not necessarily. Mm -hmm. Should everybody uh, have a dermatologist? Anyone can have a dermatologist. We see everyone from the youngest babies that may come in with an abnormal mole to older folks. Uh, some people will say after age 50, everyone should have a full body exam every year, but, but by no means is that a hard and fast limit. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have a family history of melanoma, you know, come in and get a full body check once or twice a year. We see teenagers, we see children, parents bringing their children in when they have had a melanoma in the past to be screened. So melanoma can occur in any person in any age group in almost any area of the body. It certainly would give you peace of mind if you mm -hmm. came in to see you for, mm -hmm. for a check of moles and a scan of your body and you gave me the you know, checked me off that I was okay. So and use photography to actually follow those moles with time, standardized medical photography. Let's talk about moles, and we've got four examples of moles, mm -hmm. um, dangerous moles. Mm -hmm. And, Joe, if you could pop those up too right now. With moles, we talk a lot about the A, B, C, D, E criteria of evaluating a mole. It's a great way for a person at home to be able to look at a mole and see if it's abnormal. We look at asymmetry, and this mole is obviously asymmetrical. Mm -hmm. It has two different colors, two different sides. It also has border irregularity. There's one with B. The border's irregular. Okay. That's a sign. Uh, abnormal coloration, or C, if you see multiple colors within the mole as opposed to one uniform color, that's a concern, and this one has two. Mm -hmm. uh, diameter. Generally, a diameter larger than the size of the end of a pencil eraser, or six millimeters, is of concern. Okay. But we see melanomas of different sizes. That's not the best criteria to use. Mm -hmm. And then the most important one we're now looking at is E, or evolution, which is the change of that mole with time. If you see a mole on your body that's changing, that's uh, maybe it's bleeding or it's itching more or uh, ulcerating in any way or looking like it's open, that's certainly something you want to get checked out. Or something that's just popped up on your body. What about that, mm -hmm. too, if you, you were fine and then you just notice on your foot or mm -hmm. on your finger something that looks like a mole? Is that an indication that it might be something dangerous? It can be, and if you're not sure, get it checked out. I would not, never tell somebody that if they had a concerning mole, no matter what it was, to have it looked at because the worst that we can say is it's fine, you don't have to worry about this mole, but you'll be glad you did if there's something wrong with it. Okay, so back to the whole skin cancer and sun damage topic too. Mm -hmm. For SPF, should you use something, a different SPF on your face than your body? Is there a certain type that you recommend for people? For sunscreen, I recommend a broad spectrum. SPF should be at least 15 and generally 30. Okay. I tell people to use, if, if they're really going to be outside for just a limited period of time during the day, like maybe going to work in the car, mm -hmm. but 15 will be adequate. It will block 96% of the ultraviolet rays. Mm -hmm. If you're going to be out for an extended period of time, I always recommend stepping up to a 30, which box blocks me 99% of ultraviolet rays. Beyond that, you're really not getting any additional benefit from higher numbers. The key with sunscreen is to apply the sunscreen at least a half an hour before you go outside. Mm -hmm. That allows it to soak into the skin and work and work at the base layer. That's one mistake many people make. The other is you need to reapply. Right, no how sunscreen. often? No sunscreen should really be allowed to work on the body, whether it says waterproof or not, for more than two hours. Okay. If you're wet, if you get wet or sweaty, you should reapply. Okay, and 
so you don't necessarily need to have a different one on your face or your body or a, a fancy one on your face and a generic one on your body. I do actually recommend different sunscreens for the face. The face okay. is a completely different area of the skin, the body. It's, it's makeup is different. There's much more, many more hair follicles and oil glands, more prone to acne, whatnot. I recommend a facial product for the face. It's going to be less likely to cause uh, breakouts. It's going to be less greasy. It's going to be easier to apply in the face, and it's going to stay on better. What about these different types of makeup that has sunscreen already built in it? Do you recommend that and a sunscreen or say your base um, has or your moisturizer has a 15 in it? Is that sufficient or is that kind of a scam? Not sufficient. No, it's not a scam. I mean, it's great. They can say they have an SPF rating because there are ingredients in many makeups such as titanium dioxide and zinc oxide, which are actually part and parcel of the makeup itself, mm -hmm. which are sunscreens but it's not a substitute because you're not going to apply makeup in the way you would apply sunscreen and that you're not going to go for full coverage. Right. You're going to apply that makeup to certain areas. So it's always good to use a face sunscreen underneath and then your makeup on top. What about you used to see in the movies back from the 80s and early 90s, the lifeguards that would have just the white hair all over their face? Mm -hmm. Is that something that's completely blocking out the sun or was that just fashion. No, that was actually zinc oxide. Okay. Do we use that anymore? We use it, but we've now micronized it into particles that are small enough that they block the sun, but they don't appear white on uh -huh. the surface. They may appear a little frosty when you first apply them in a way you work them in, but our technology has improved to the point where we don't have to do and that And our anymore. fashions have changed. That's yes. not so yeah. cute anymore. Yeah. Okay. Pr with pregnancy, your skin goes through a lot of changes, something that's obviously on my mind mm -hmm. right now. Um, what can you use on your face for um, sunblock? Any sunblock fine when you're pregnant? Sunblock is fine when you're pregnant. For prescription medications, the FDA has come up with a little list, a little category. They have a rating scale. It's A, B, C, D, and then X. Basically, products that are in the A category are not very, not very prevalent because those are the ones that would have to have been tested. Right. I'm pregnant, we don't do that type of testing. So the first category you'll generally see is B. Okay. B is generally recognized as a safe pregnancy medicine. Um, something like an erythromycin antibiotics um, gel mm -hmm. would be safe. Maybe a topical. And what would you uh, use that for? The erythromycin for acne. Gel? Okay. If someone had acne when they're pregnant, you can use it. We really don't use very much in pregnant women as far as our treatments go. We want to, you know, be very careful. Mm -hmm. uh, we ask them to stay out of the sun. We reserve all of our laser treatments and peels and things till after they're done preg uh, with pregnancy and breastfeeding. Do you see many of your pregnant patients with the so-called pregnancy mask? What is that? Bit. Pregnancy mask is basically, in the medical term is called melasma. Mm -hmm. It's an increase in the pigment in the skin that's driven by hormones. Mm -hmm. So usually it'd be in the central part of the face, the forehead, the cheeks, the chin area will have a darkening, dark patches, mm -hmm. and that's what we call the mask of pregnancy. Does it go away after you have your baby, or does it sometimes stick around and need a little extra help from some of your bleaching agents? It's, it's both. I mean, some patients it'll completely go away by itself, and some it'll stay, and we have lots of treatments. We do use uh, bleaching agents to treat that. We also use lasers as well, depending mm -hmm. on the patient's condition. Also, the most important thing in that is to stay out of the sun and wear sunscreen, because no matter how um, clear you get it with products or with laser, if you go out and get a good suntan, it can come right back to you. So you can reverse all of this wonderful work that you've done if you get out in the sun. Mm -hmm, very easily. So recommend just staying under a hat. Staying under a hat, wearing, using good professional skincare products that can help to maintain the results of treatments or just to prevent or, you know, reverse the sun damage that you have. Okay, great information. Thank mm -hmm. you. And thank you for joining us for this version of Health Beat. If you'd like for more information on this show or information on Dr. Schlesinger, you can always visit our website at rsfh.com or you can call the Health Beat hotline and you, we can put you in touch with him. The number is 724-2670. Have a great day.